What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back out again with another video. So we're gonna check out biggest bust in WWE history. This should be a interesting one. We've seen it time and time again, where WWE presents someone as the next big thing or this next mega star, and either they get injured or you know the booking doesn't land or people don't find the character or the wrestler that interesting and they end up falling by the wayside end up becoming enhancement enhancement talent jags and ultimately future endeavored so we're gonna check this out appreciate all the love and support y'all showing on the channel it's very ironic who the first person on this screen is like in the background i'm not gonna say anything because i don't want people to feel like i'm bullying them or being mean or targeting them but it's just very ironic that that particular person is on the screen right now but i'm not gonna say anything the biggest busts in wwe history be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell number one giant gonzalez mm -hmm. remember the undertaker's favorite wrestlemania opponent well believe it or not but giant gonzalez had a solid career before joining the company in 1993 he was a main staple in wcw that even feuded with rick flair for the wcw world heavyweight title but the problem with Giant Gonzalez was that he simply wasn't a good wrestler. Mm -hmm. However, it's been well known how much Vince McMahon values height and probably creamed his pants when he saw the near <laughs> eight foot beast. Gonzalez made his WWE debut in a big way by eliminating The Undertaker at 93's Royal Rumble. That led to a match between the two at WrestleMania 9 and it's considered to be one of the worst matches of all time. The Taker-Gonzalez feud lasted until SummerSlam and then it was all downhill for the Giant. After playing the Shelby body with the suit. stars, Gonzalez was released the same year in October. It was clear that Vince wanted Gonzalez to be another Andre the Giant type monster, but Gonzalez's lack of wrestling ability was the biggest contribution to his downfall. The body suit Number is two, killing me. Taz. Taz's WWE career seemed so promising when he made his debut at the Royal Rumble in Madison Square Garden. Seeing him and Kurt Angle in the same ring was unreal. Taz was at the peak of his career thanks to his legendary run in ECW. Mm -hmm. The former ECW world champion had the skills and charisma to be a top WWE star, but Vince McMahon likely didn't see much value for Taz beyond mid-card. He didn't. He quickly lost to Triple H on SmackDown, further cementing that he wasn't going to be nothing more than a mid-card wrestler. Mm -hmm. What ultimately killed Taz's career was the mounting injuries that put him in the commentary booth. However, Taz was never able to top his strong debut against Kurt Angle. The Olympic gold medalist shed some light on why Taz never reached a higher level in WWE. I think the reason was Vince McMahon had this idea of Taz being a smaller guy and selling for the big guys and never giving up. And Taz had in his mind that he wanted to be a dominant wrestler and just beat everybody out dominantly. They, they didn't want him to be, he didn't want himself to be the underdog that mm -hmm. was fighting from underneath. And I think that's the reason why they kind of ended Taz's career a little bit early was because he had a different idea of what the what the creative had for him. And uh, and then they made him a commentary. So uh, that, yep. that was pretty much the end of Taz's career. I, I don't think he lasted that long after this. Sound about right. In some ways, this makes sense. Taz was a believable badass in ECW because his in-ring prowess and size gave him that illusion. But when it came to WWE, he was no longer one of the big dogs in the yard. In theory, Vince's idea is sound as it still paints him as a badass, but in the role of an underdog. Yeah. It's a shame that Taz's debut remains the most memorable part of his WWE career, but the fact that he didn't even get a run with the Intercontinental title is a crime against humanity. Number 3. Karma yep. Despite what WWE too. history would tell you, TNA Wrestling was the first promotion in North America to have a women's revolution. When the company introduced its knockout division in 2007, they had a diverse set of talented women on its roster. But Awesome Kong and Gail Kim mm -hmm. made the world take notice by having one of the best women's feuds ever. Awesome Kong was an accomplished wrestler. She fought across the globe in Japan, Shimmer and Ring of Honor with TNA finally giving her the spotlight she deserved. When she finally signed with WWE in 2011, Awesome Kong represented hope that the company would finally take the women's division seriously. Mm -hmm. The creepy vignettes were simply perfect. Her character got over instantly and Facts. she stood out from all of the other women on the roster. Bro, she, she was a force to, you know, reckon with, bro. Like, she, when you saw her, you knew she could probably beat up some of the guys on the roster like what are we talking about <laughs> her debut was equally strong as she had the fans buzzing about what she would do next 
Unfortunately, that all came crashing down when Karma was forced to disappear due to her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. It seemed that she was back on track when she made a return at the 2012 Royal Rumble match, but sadly, she was released six months later. According to Kia Stevens herself, she wasn't mentally or physically prepared for a WWE run. Mm. The former TNA Knockouts champion had a miscarriage and never fully mm. recovered from that traumatic experience. The former TNA Knockouts champion felt that the release was a blessing in disguise as she hoped to return to the company one day. Karma really could have been a difference maker as Vince seemed to care about the character in the beginning. It's a shame that she never got another opportunity That's to tough, prove bro. how great she was to a wider audience. That's tough. Number 4 Gail Kim too. Speaking of the TNA knockouts, the pioneer of the division was no stranger to WWE. He made a Raw debut in 2002 and immediately won the WWE Women's Championship. Despite the cool Matrix-like entrance and her alliance with Molly Holly, her first stint in WWE was directionless because the company didn't seem to understand what to do with her. However, Kim was on WWE's radar thanks to her incredible feud with Awesome Kong. She came back with some hype surrounding her name, but unfortunately for Kim, it was clear that WWE still didn't see her as a top star. Mm -hmm. She had some fun matches throughout her short stint, but it was nothing compared to what she did in TNA. The former WWE Women's Champion was just another girl on the roster by the time 2011 because her character was non-existent. Like yeah. Awesome Kong, Gail Kim had all the tools to elevate the division to new heights, but Vince didn't understand what made the former Knockouts Champion work in TNA, nor did he ever put much effort into trying to give us something meaningful. That's Number good. 5, Austin Aries. That's definitely, I mean, this list is actually pretty spot on. It, it just really falls down to a lot of things Vince not deeming as something like i wouldn't say worthy enough because obviously they're worthy enough to be on television but in a sense of he didn't view them as they viewed themselves or didn't really have a great understanding or maybe didn't even want to have a greater understanding on how to potentially book these individuals so that way they can get over on wwe television so before Aries stepped foot in a WWE ring, he was touted as one of the best professional wrestlers on the indie scene. Mm -hmm. However, it was his run in TNA that elevated his status as a possible WWE star. Despite his size, he was the total package. He had mountains of charisma, his mic skills were off the charts, and he was a fantastic in-ring performer. This is a rarity for any wrestler to have, and he could have been the exception to Vince McMahon's height rule because the guy understands character and the psychology of wrestling. Mm -hmm. However, the only negative about Austin Aries was his backstage attitude. Rumors have always painted Aries as a pain in the ass backstage, and even former TNA World Heavyweight Champion admitted this in an interview with VOC Nation. I'm sure I can be a pain in the ass because I have my own opinions. Those aren't always welcome in a high pressure situation where they're just trying to dump out content. Again, I've used the analogy. They, for the most part, when you're hired there, they want you to be a line cook. I'm a gourmet chef. Mm. And so when I'm trying to, you know, add some of my own ideas of how the recipe could be improved, they're like, hey, we're McDonald's. We sell a billion hamburgers. Mm -hmm. Before his release in 2017, comparison. the company seemed to like him. He used his gift to the gap to get over on commentary, and his first pay per view match was at WrestleMania. But Aries ultimately did nothing in his WWE nope. run. Rumors swelled that Aries was a much like backstage because WWE officials hated his self entitlement. Any chance of him returning was killed when he pulled out Bound for Glory stunt in 2018 following his match against Johnny Impact. Mm -hmm. He became blacklisted from most of the major wrestling companies after that moment. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Austin Aries was his own worst enemy. The guy had all the talent in the world, but his rumor behavior issues are the reason his career hit the ceiling. Number 6, DDP. Mm. Diamond Dallas Page's brief run will go down as one of the worst stints in company history. <laughs> DDP was far from the greatest wrestler on the roster, but he was levels above Kevin Nash and Goldberg. More importantly, the guy had the it factor that he showcased during his time in WCW. He quickly mm -hmm. rose from a lower card act to one of, w to one of WCW's top babyfaces organically before he had an incredible on-screen presence. But for some reason, this hot baby face that could have been a draw for WWE was turned into a crazy stalker in his debut. DDP yeah, that, that, you, uh, you just gotta wonder what the hell are they saying in these, these, these meetings? Like, how are they pitching these ideas? And then just Vince just like, hey, fuck it, let's go with it, pal. Like, I'll just be so confused. You, it, it, sometimes to me, it feels like, the simplest approach is the best approach. You don't have to overcomplicate, overbook things. Just give someone a simple 
I mean, I would work with him in WCW. I'm pretty sure would have worked with him in WWE or WWF at the time. It's just, I don't know. I just, just the overcomplications of people it, moving from one company to another. Yeah, you can switch some things up. I just don't, the stalker route, I, I don't know about that one. It, it, to this day, it still kind of baffles me. Himself admitted that he regrets the storyline, uh. which was actually pitched to Stone Cold Steve Austin beforehand. Wow. Page was buried throughout the story, and he was even pinned by The Undertaker's wife. wife yeah. The former three-time WCW World Heavyweight Champion was treated as a complete joke, and it didn't get better when the company tried to change his gimmick into a motivational speaker. It wasn't as bad as the stalker storyline, but DDP <laughs> never gained any momentum before nope. he was stuck with terrible stories that resulted him in jobbing to the stars. Yep. DDP was a shell of his former self, which was no fault of his own. His career may not have lasted long, but there were no signs that WWE were going to book him better. Nope. Number 7. Scott Steiner mm. I think it's safe to say that most of the WCW stars in WWE flopped hard. Unlike DDP, WWE treated Steiner as a main event star when he first arrived in 2002. Steiner had everything Vince McMahon wanted in a wrestler, yeah. a great physique, strong promo skills, and a decent in-ring worker. His time was memorable in WCW because he felt unique That's from the crazy, entire bro. roster. Him walking had... out there with a fucking lion is fucking wild. <laughs> An incredible run with his brother Rick as a tag team champion, but Steiner going solo as Big Papa Pump is what turned him into a main eventer. Mm -hmm. He was an obnoxious asshole who could beat you up and steal your girl. Yeah. Unfortunately, WWE didn't get this memo. He was brought in as a blind babyface instead of the charismatic heel character that got over in WCW. It didn't help that Steiner had two terrible matches oh, against Triple yeah. H. His performance killed his dreams of main eventing again since he plummeted down to the yep, lower. Those, yeah. And that's how it is in WWE. They, they'll give you one shot. They may give you a second shot if you fell on both of them. Yeah, that's it. You're getting dropped down the card. And that's exactly what happened, bro. He got dropped down the card after those matches. Card immediately. Steiner's failure in WWE can be attributed to both creative and the man himself. He never showed Vince why he belonged in the main event, but he didn't give him many opportunities to do so either. Number 8. Sting mm. Out of all the WCW legends, Sting's run in the company is easily the most disappointing. Super Sting represented the bro. best parts of WCW, and it could be argued that he wasted his best years in TNA, but the short period that Sting had in WWE wasn't a positive indication that he would have been better served under Vince McMahon's creative genius. There was a huge excitement over Sting's shocking debut at Survivor so Series, cool, but all of Sting's aura was killed when he jobbed in his very first WWE match. Mm. It's just... It's... It's nerve-wracking. It's it's infuriating, you could say, irritating to know that his only WrestleMania match he fucking lost in a match that it just he didn't need to lose. It just made no sense for him to lose. Like it, it uh match his second match wasn't any better and the career-threatening injury had nothing to do with the lackluster bill between rollins and sting though no one expected the former wcw world heavyweight champion to pull out classics at this stage of his career sting felt like just another guy on the roster yeah his career may have been cut short based on a freak accident but he didn't feel like an icon at any point in his brief wwe stint number nine lex luger a million dollar body i will say this at least aew they treated him right for the most part and made him feel like where he should have been. So I can appreciate that. That's the one thing I can say. I can appreciate what AEW did for him. Doesn't equal a successful career. When you hear about Lex Luger, he's considered a legend in this business. Mm -hmm. He made a splash in NWA and WCW mainly because of his perfect body. But that isn't to say that Luger wasn't a solid performer. He certainly got over thanks to his time in the Four Horsemen and his reign as WCW World Heavyweight Champion helped increase his popularity. So what exactly happened? Well, unlike many other names on this list, WWE tried their damned hardest to push Luger as the next big thing. Yep. They pushed him as the narcissist with the gimmick being that Luger would pose in front of a mirror in every match. Luger had the looks to pull off the gimmick, but his charisma paled in comparison to what a main event star should be. And then Hulk Hogan left WWE in 93. Uh -huh. Vince McMahon needed a new face of the company. And instead of going with a guy like Bret Hart or The Undertaker, he chose Luger. Uh, yeah. Luger dropped the narcissist act and became Mr. All-American. But that only damaged him further. Hogan was by no means a fantastic wrestler either, but the guy had personality and charisma. Subtract 95% of that and you get Lex Luger. That's, was that's essentially what it was. Once you take 
all the charisma out of it you got lex luger <laughs> clear that the former wcw world heavyweight champion was a cheap replacement for hulkamania vince wisely opted not to put the belt on luger at wrestlemania 10 once he realized that luger wasn't the guy to replace hulk hogan Sometimes a guy just doesn't have the it factor. Mm -hmm. And there's no denying Luger's success and popularity in WCW, but it didn't click much with the WWE audience, despite Vince McMahon trying his damned hardest to push him as the next big thing. Number 10, Cain Velasquez. Oh boy, where do we begin? Look, Cain Velasquez will go down as one of the best UFC heavyweights in the company's history. For sure. There's no denying his skill as a fighter. Hell, he had some skill as a pro wrestler, as before he made his way into WWE, he was making some moves in Lucha Libre AAA. Mm -hmm. The problem? WWE didn't want Cain Velasquez, the luchador. They wanted a guy who beat Brock Lesnar for the UFC Heavyweight yeah. Championship at UFC 121. Unfortunately, that guy looked like an amateur when he and Lesnar amateur when he and Lesnar collided at Crown Jewel. But it wasn't just the fact that Velasquez lost his debut match. He didn't have the look of a WWE superstar, and he wasn't known for his charisma like Shawn Michaels. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it was kind of a mystery why they signed him in the first place. A rumors are that Vince wanted a marquee athlete for Crown Jewel, and apparently Tyson Fury wasn't enough. Velasquez is considered a UFC legend, but he wasn't an international star like McGregor. Mm -hmm. He could have developed into something special if they sent him down to the performance center first, but it felt as if Velasquez's only purpose was to lose to Brock Lesnar. Yeah, it was a waste of everybody's time, bro. Respect to him for what he did in the Octagon, but we, we, could, we could see right through it. It was a waste of fucking time, bro. It was a waste of time. That's all this was, bro. Waste of time. And Gable Stevenson. Not everyone can be Kurt Angle, and WWE found this out the hard way with the failure of Gable Stevenson. The company touted Gable big time as he made numerous pay per view appearances that highlighted him as a special attraction. He was even drafted to the Raw brand in 2021, but he wouldn't make his official debut until July 30th, 2023, and it did not go well. Gable was far from terrible. His suplexes looked solid and his movement could have been worse, but he was no freaking Kurt Angle. Mm -hmm. The match was a massive misfire with fans and critics and Gable Stevenson wouldn't be seen on TV again. Yeah. It's clear that Stevenson wasn't ready for primetime television, but there's also a question on how much his heart was really into pro wrestling. His outside projects seemed more important than his spot on the WWE roster. All that hype for a wrestler who turned out to be less than average at best. They have it, I think he's a... Uh... Uh, I forgot who drafted him. I don't know if it was the Bills or Minnesota. Some team actually not drafted him, but picked him up. He got uh picked up to one of the NFL teams. Y'all let me know. I think it was the Bills. It was either Bills or the Vikings, one of the two. But they ended up picking him up. Um, and then there was also the stuff that he was dealing with, the allegations he was dealing with. So it, it just it didn't work out like they expected it to. But it's that's part of the game. Not everybody that you expect to be this big time main eventer actually end up being that big time main eventer comment down below let me know some other wrestlers that weren't listed on here that had the opportunity to be the next big thing in wwe and they end up being the next next big bust but i appreciate all the love and support y'all showing on the channel rose on 50k and i'm still going to be the youtube wrestling champ of the world appreciate y'all kicking with me see you on the next one peace